I first saw the ship, I was overwhelmed, as I am every time I see it now. I, I'm overwhelmed. Every conflict the United States was involved in, Enterprise played some kind of role. When I was loading bombs and rockets and guns, I tried to do my job, make sure it worked. So when the pilot went over there, it worked for him. I was 50 to 100 feet away from the plane when it exploded. I said, we had to save the ship. Where would we go? We had to save the ship. I didn't wait for any orders. I said to redirect the battle group to make best speed to the coast of Pakistan. The legendary ship, and it's, it's a great honor to be the last crew to be part of this 51-year-old ship. When you go to sea on that, it'll put a lump in your throat. I was assigned to the Enterprise, what they call a pre-commissioning, and I checked on board uh, 31 May of 1960, and the ship wasn't commissioned until 60, November of 61, so I was here, one of the first original 20 members of the crew. As the ship got closer to completion, uh, we went on the ship daily and went into compartments as the shipyard was finishing them, and we did acceptance inspections for the, for the Navy. Chief Petty Officer Thomas Buchanan would be busy with compartment inspections for a few months. That's because there were 3,500 of them to approve. By the time we were commissioned, I knew my way around better than 90% of the crew <laughs> because I'd been to so many places on it all the time. This is there were 2,400 miles of blueprints when they first drew up the Enterprise. There were over 60,000 tons of steel that went into the construction of the ship. That's more steel than went into the Empire State Building when it was built. At a cost of $500 million, the ship was mammoth in size and innovation. It was the world's first nuclear aircraft carrier. I was the top man in my class, and that's what got me into the nuclear Navy. That's what got me into Rickover's Navy. Rickover's Navy was that of Admiral Hyman Rickover, the father of the nuclear Navy. Serving a record 63 years as an officer, he was known for his smarts, his innovations, his eccentricity, and his bluster. I guess I had been here maybe um, two months. I was on a midnight watch, and Admiral Rickover, who is the father of the nuclear navy, shows up at 2 o'clock in the morning in a civilian clothes. He walks up and he says, do you know who I am? I, no, sir. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, Hyman Rickover. I, I said, welcome aboard. <laughs> His nickname was the kindly old gentleman, but there was nothing kindly about him. Rickover designed the first nuclear reactors, then modified them to power submarines and later aircraft carriers. And he was very particular about who got to use the technology. He insisted on personally interviewing and selecting each candidate. For me personally, the, the Rickover interview was a bit of a challenge. Retired Captain Bill Toady ran Rickover's gauntlet, which was by then a thing of legend. My first run at him didn't last more than 15 seconds. He looked at my academic record and he got tripped up over a course I had taken and essentially threw me out. I had no longer hit my chair, that I was up and out of the chair and on my way out of the room. It was not pleasant. Toady pleaded for another chance, which he got and wound up personally confirming one of the rumors about Rickover, his penchant for sending students to the broom closet. This was a janitor's closet with a deep sink and, and mops and brooms and bad smells. For two hours he sat, held captive with the tools of his immigrant ancestors, slowly realizing the opportunity that might be slipping away. I came out of that closet two hours later, a much smarter young man. President Ronald Reagan retired Rickover in 1982, a legend, largely responsible for much of what the Big E was made of, power and versatility. What nuclear power does is that it allows a ship to go anywhere it needs to go without the need for the constant refueling that conventional oil-powered ships would need. Less fuel means more space. The Enterprise could carry 72 aircraft and reach speeds around 30 knots. I was on that first shakedown cruise, and that was really wonderful because you were going all ahead full, 
and then all of a sudden they get all the way, all, all, all back. So, so you're, that's a scream. I mean, all it does is stand there and vibrate. And then first thing it starts going backwards. When you were out to sea and you were running, the wake went as far as you could see. It seemed like it went over the horizon. This thing would scream. This thing would just fly. You know, nobody wants to tell you how fast this ship will go, but I guarantee you there's not another ship ever been built that could touch it. I remember in the Med, we had a drag race with the uh, Bainbridge and the Long Beach were nuclear powered. And about four or five hours after we got underway in the race, you couldn't see them on the, on the horizon. We, we left them in the dust. <laughs> The USS Enterprise's first assignment was more space than sea oriented. As Lieutenant Colonel John Glenn became the first American to orbit Earth, the Enterprise served as a tracking and measuring station. Her first crisis call was in October of 1962, when the U.S. received word the Soviet Union was constructing nuclear missile launch sites in Cuba. There was also a hurricane off the coast of Virginia at the time, and when we pulled out from Pier 12, they told us we were pulling out because of a hurricane, to ride out the hurricane. In reality, we were going to Cuba for a missile crisis. President Kennedy, who'd been aboard for an operations demonstration this spring before, ordered a naval blockade. And when the Chief of Naval Operations told President Kennedy, Mr. President, we will not let you down, the Enterprise was a key part of the reason he knew the Navy was not going to disappoint him. Even though I was an admin type person, a yeoman, I spent, I spent just every day loading bombs and missiles on, on, on uh, planes when they were, cause we were flying them every day. Then. We went down there and all we did was cruise around Cuba the whole time, never saw land and uh, just went on patrol, that was it. I had heard somebody mention that they were canceling leave, and I was getting ready to go on leave with my brother. So uh, I went down, I got him, and we signed each other out on leave, but we couldn't get off the ship, so I <clears throat> put my uniform in an empty trash can, and we asked permission to go ashore and dump garbage, got in our cars and drove home. <laughs> Needless to say, they were waiting for us when we got there and flew us right back down to Cuba. So. <laughs> You were in on that. I was in on that too. <laughs> was idea, it was right? his idea. He was older than I am. <laughs> yeah, I got home and there was a lieutenant commander in the kitchen looking at his watch. He said, yeah, you kids made pretty good time. <laughs> I left Pier 12 uh, to ride out a hurricane and I didn't see the United States uh, for another year and four months because <laughs> I got transferred to Cuba at the end of the missile crisis for a year. <laughs> The Enterprise went on world cruises designed to show off its strengths to allies and to enemies. Oil and Water Gang was called. Uh, purified water, transferred it for all the uh, uses on the ship, and the fuel oil was taken on that uh, powered generators, and also we carried the fuel for the other ships because they weren't nuclear powered. I supplied all of the electrical power to the aircraft prior to starting, refueling, and that sort of stuff. I don't think I missed more than a couple of flights or uh, a couple of launches or recoveries in, in the years I was on it. I made every single one of them. So I was on deck 16, 18 hours a day. Enjoyed every second of it. Why was it important to follow your brother? Uh, because he had better duty than I was getting. <laughs> so I picked the best. I guarantee you there's a lot of these plank owners around and there's a lot of these former sailors around uh, that, that maybe didn't serve two years on this ship and 40 or 50 years later they're coming back, uh, you know, to see Enterprise. So there's, there's certainly a, a great pride uh, with the crew. You know, when I first saw the ship I was overwhelmed, as, as I am every time I see it now, I, I'm overwhelmed. Oh my God. <laughs> when you go to sea on that, it'll put a lump in your throat. That's, uh, that was quite a showpiece back then, and it still is today. It was probably, um, uh, for my entire Navy career, this was the best I ever had.
F.A. Paul Akers, Jr. A.N. David M. Ashbury. Lieutenant J.G. Carl B. Burkle. Lieutenant J.G. James. Reading H. those names reminds me that uh, maybe if I'd have done something different, we wouldn't be here today reading those names. A.N. Ernest L. Foster. A.B.H.A.N. Delbert D. Gertie. A.E.C. Ronald E. Hay. But on the morning of 14 January 1969, just barely into her eighth year, Enterprise fought for her very existence. Her loss that day would have rendered her glorious beginnings a faint memory on today's horizon, her subsequent achievements non-existent, and her legacy truncated by tragedy. But Enterprise was not lost that day. She sits here today, a grand old lady on the eve of her retirement, because her crew, our shipmates, our brothers, fought and bled and died so that she would live on. The USS Enterprise was in Hawaiian waters undergoing an operational readiness inspection. The crew had been called to general quarters. I was a flight deck yellow shirt. I directed airplanes on the flight deck. And that morning, uh, after the beginning of the second launch, uh, I came out of flight deck control with the list of about four or five aircraft that I was responsible for starting. And I signaled for a helper driver. Mr. Wester came down and asked me which one to go to, and I pointed to the Phantom that he was to start up. And I put on my flight gear. And next thing I knew, I'll help broke loose. The Huffer is what starts the aircraft. This Huffer was parked by this aircraft and they had Zuni missile loaded aboard, rockets. And he had his exhaust going and it was blowing right on the head of the weapon. And they said some guy ran up and told one of the inspectors that there's a weapon back here, that, that rocket head is turning cherry red and about that time that's when it blew. So all the shrapnel punched holes in all the airplanes and fuel tanks. So you had fuel running all over the deck, down below, caught on fire. I believe they had eight major explosions aboard the flight deck. I was assigned by a chief petty officer to grab fire hose and run aft, and I did. When I stepped out on that flight deck, I looked aft, and the whole back of the ship was on fire. That whole sky was black, and under it was just a glowing yellow fire. And all the airplanes were on fire. Bombs were blowing up, rockets were shooting all over the place. It was a mess, just a mess. Bodies everywhere. It was bad. And I was up there four hours, and it was a mess. I lost three very close friends that day. I was maybe 50 to 100 feet away from the plane when it exploded. And when I came to, I was on the flight deck. Someone helped me in, inside, bodies. You know, I'm laying on the floor, the, the plane that was behind the island structure exploded and it burst the water main and it began filling up. Uh, I was then transported to sick bay and they flew me into Triple Army Hospital by Hilo. We had, we had two planes that were on fire, they were right over there and they were pointing toward each other. And it looked like complete planes from the side we were on. But when we finally got through them after the fire was out on them, we realized that the engines had fallen out of the plane, they were leaning to the side, and, and there was just nothing left of the plane. And then there was another A3 on the on the hangar deck, or on the elevator back there that had burned, and the only thing left of it was one engine and just a piece of the wing. The rest of the plane was gone. It burned a hole in the elevator. Just beside that, there was a 21-foot hole in the flight deck. 27 men died in the fire. More than 300 were hurt. 15 aircraft destroyed. Investigators' reports revealed the crew had fought an heroic battle to save their fighting gray lady. The Enterprise investigation revealed the character of a crew that would not be defeated, that would not give up, that would not relent to the inferno that took the lives of their shipmates. Because the intensity of the fire was well aft, the heat was so much that you couldn't get across back there. 
you couldn't possibly fight that fire. There was uncommon valor in the attitude that the deck crewmen had in manning their hoses and going back into it. So when an explosion would cut half of them down, additional people would appear, reman the hoses, and go back into the area of the fire. I sit here through that plane. I've lived with this guilt for the past 40 years because every day I've done this job, but this day it went wrong. And, you know, it's, it's something that I carry with me constantly. I said, we had to save the ship. Where would we go? We had to save the ship. I didn't really get it then. I knew now. The Big E returned to the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard for repairs. Just a few months later, she headed back out to sea for her second Vietnam deployment, carrying additional crew. Well, I was the safety chief, the first safety chief aboard the aircraft, this aircraft carrier, set up department. The reason they set it up and went was it's just right after the explosion aboard this ship. So they finally decided, hey, we need some safety department to look after this. Bryant and three others set about making rules about handling ordnance and starting aircraft. Safety act uh, rules are written in blood. Accidents just don't happen, they're caused by, you know, not paying attention and just one event leading up to another. On the flight deck, tempo increased as the Enterprise along with the Oriskany and the Midway combined to launch more than 2,000 strike sorties from Yankee Station. By 1972, the U.S. had launched 23,650 tactical air attack sorties into North Vietnam. Our days ran 16, 18 hours. Flight ops daily ran, you figure, about 12 hour flight ops, but you had preparation to get ready for flight ops, you had preparation afterwards. What was the, what was the role of the Enterprise during that war, during those years you were on board? To drop bombs go after the Ho Chi Minh Trail or go up to north in Vietnam and drop bombs. And this ship was always a fighter. She wanted to do the most all the time, always had to be the best, and they was. What made it the best? I think the crew and the spirit. It was a good crew. Uh, it was a good ship. I mean, I'm proud of this ship. When I was loading bombs and rockets and guns, I tried to do my job, make sure it worked. So when the pilot went over there, it worked for him. At least he had something to throw back at him. And that's the way I thought about it. I was an observer. I know it was that safety observer going around and checking people, checking people on the flight deck, make sure they had the goggles on, their sleeves rolled down, things like that, you know. Um, watching safety, people driving vehicles, paying attention. So during the operation of flight landings and takeoffs, the flight deck is one of the most dangerous places to be. you got to remember, these people on the flight deck, the average age of them is about 19 years old. I was old, but that's the average age. And these are kids out there, just out of their teens, doing the job. And they did a damn good job. I think it's a big disappointment that's going out now. I mean, it's a good thing. You hate to see good things go by, you know, go away. late afternoon on the, on the 11th of September. Uh, I was up on the flag bridge working out by myself. And I got a phone call that said, um, Admiral, uh, we believe a small plane has flown into the World Trade Center in New York. And I said, a small plane? And I said, do we have any preliminary intelligence assessment at all? And uh, my battle watch captain said, we believe it's a cyber attack against the FAA. Vice Admiral John Morgan had assumed command of the Enterprise Battle Group on September 8, 2001. I had just let all my SEALs go, and we were <clears throat> getting ready for a port call in South Africa. He got back to his cabin, turned on his television, and saw the North Tower burning. What caught my military eye was there was not a cloud in the sky in New York. 
and my chief of staff had come through a doorway and I said, this is no cyber attack against the FAA. And um, moments later, the second airplane hit. And I did two things reflexively. I picked up the phone and called the captain of the aircraft carrier. And I said to redirect the battle group to make best speed to the coast of Pakistan, thinking that this was probably the work of bin Laden. And the second thing I did was I turned to my keyboard and I wrote to my lead SEAL, and I won't use my sailor's language that I used to him, but I told him to get back here quickly and bring his guns. So I didn't wait for any orders. We put the battle group into a strong defensive crouch, not knowing if some other airplane would become, you know, plummeting out of the skies after the USS Enterprise, sort of the symbol of American naval strength. And we put fighters up, and we had uh, missile systems ready to go, and we were tracking aircraft very carefully, um, civilian aircraft very carefully, to see any departure from a normal pattern. We were prepared to warn people. We were prepared to fire warning shots if need be. The Big E stood by, keeping watch until she was called into action. We launched the first strikes on the evening of the 7th of October. And I can remember um, being in the command center, watching the orders go out, watching the information being conveyed. But then I walked up to the flag bridge and arrayed around me were the ships of the battle force and, um, and just watched the sky start lighting up and knowing that uh, those cruise missiles were on their way to their targets. We would launch our first aircraft at uh, usually around 10 o'clock at night, 2200, and we would recover our last aircraft at uh, about 1 p.m. the next day. It was a long hike. In three weeks, aircraft from Enterprise flew more than 700 missions. Well after originally scheduled, the Enterprise came home to Norfolk. It was just a joyous day. But you could tell how America had changed. I mean, um, just entering the channel into Norfolk was different. Um, you, you could, there was so much sense of added security. Even when we got alongside the pier, we could tell several armed, you know, military personnel providing perimeter security. It was, it was different. Enterprise played a key role in the war on terror over the next decade, supporting operations Iraqi and enduring freedom, and even assisting in the capture of Somali pirates after they hijacked the Maersk, Alabama. It wasn't until 2009, now the oldest carrier in the naval fleet, that the Enterprise began to show her age. A scheduled maintenance and refurbishing wound up costing $622 million, nearly 50% over budget. Keeping her operational and outfitted with the latest technologies was becoming too costly. It was sad to admit, as this historic ship neared the end of her service life, maintenance became more of a problem. New technologies were not as readily adapted to her older design, and new ships were entering service that were far more capable. On November 4th, 2012, USS Enterprise returned from her final deployment. It's a legendary ship, and, uh, and it's, it's a great honor to be the last crew to be part of this 51-year-old ship. There was just a couple of little electrical fires and a couple of floods here and there, busted pipes. So, 51-year-old ship, so you got some stuff that doesn't hold up, but you know, we made sure it, it was there and it held up until deployment ended. She traveled more than a million miles and had more than 400,000 carrier landings. It was involved in multiple deployments through every combat operation between 1962 all the way through 2012. Every conflict the United States was involved in, Enterprise played some kind of role. It was adaptable to every type of mission from the Cuba Missile Crisis to the War on Terror and everything in between. It was able to operate as test platforms. It was able to operate uh, new technologies. It was able to be the lead chip of around the world cruises of, of nuclear task groups, it was really able to lead the way so that other ships and other classes of aircraft carriers could follow along. Executive officer, lay the crew to shore. Aye, aye, Captain. Enterprise, disembark the ship. Command duty officer. Secure the 65 lights. Yeah, 
it, when you abort it as a pre-commissioning detail, it's like having a, a little girl born and you raise it and you teach it and you uh, care for it for years, 51 years later. Uh, it, it's like the family pet that's sick and terminal and you've got to put it down and uh, this is going to be a tough one for me. This dedicated and resilient group of men and women have indeed brought life to steel and steam, iron and oil. All right, today is my birthday and I am 70 today, so uh, looking back at 51 years ago, <laughs> it's, um, it's, um, uh, you know, there's a side of it, it's uh, sad. Oh, you have fought the good fight, you have finished the race, you have kept the faith. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, Big E, and welcome home. So I'm happy to announce the next nuclear aircraft carrier, CVN-80, will be named USS Enterprise.